Next, um, I am very excited to introduce Jan Tallinn, who is a multi-talented Estonian programmer, investor, and physicist who helped develop a program that has helped revolutionize many people's lives, including mine, Skype. It's an innovation that has received one of the highest honors, I think, at least in my opinion as a wordsmith, because it has become a verb. Like, hey, can you Skype now? He's also a co-founder of the Cambridge Center for the Study of Existential Risk, the Future of Life Institute, and is on the board of sponsors of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, and has served on the Estonian President's Academic Advisory Board. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming Jan Tal Tallinn. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Good afternoon. So let's talk about the elephant in the room. I'm glad that uh, Storm was actually making uh, this show fairly easy. Uh, first, by actually providing a demonstration of the elephant. Those of you who were here, Two days ago, when there were like 11 Nobel laureates in a half circle here, you could actually see this elephant appearing there. Because they were talking about uh, things like uh, science, Nobel Prizes. And at some point, Tonegawa san goes, wait a minute, shouldn't we be also talking about artificial intelligence? You know, machines are getting smarter. And indeed, like, that kind of conversation happens in the world a lot recently. Because like, no matter what your domain, what is the area of human endeavor, it's hard to imagine a world where it wouldn't be changed completely by sufficiently advanced artificial intelligence. Second moment here, uh, as Starmus were really smiled, was yesterday evening when Brian Greene was doing, uh, narrating the story of uh, Proxima, uh, a big spaceship that takes a uh, journey, journey to, the, to the stars. Because it perfectly clicks with the uh, introduction of my talk. Because I would really like you to now imagine a spaceship. Perhaps something like Proxima was yesterday, but probably much, much more bigger, much more realistic. Um, and not just like simple, any spaceship. Let's talk about generational spaceship, a spaceship that's big enough to fit the entire humanity. And of course, like when you are building a spaceship for the entire humanity, like you start boarding before the spaceship actually has been finished. Like the, the construction is still going on. In fact, the ship has been in making for uh, several decades now, and the boarding has begun. And everyone is really uh, excited about the upcoming trip. Now, something is not quite right about this project. The construction is consuming billions of dollars and millions of man hours each year. Yet there's a small group of people desperately trying to point out that the project has a problem. You see, nobody, nobody is working on the steering mechanism. Of course, these people are ignored. After all, this is the biggest project humanity has undertaken, so why should we anyone listen to the handful of dissidents? Also, the engineers are quick to explain why working on a steering is a complete waste of time. For instance, one large group of engineers is claiming that this thing is never going to take off anyway, so at least not in the next 300 years. Another group asserts that steering is trivial. Once we have really powerful engines, the spaceship will automatically go where we want. A third group explains that controlling this thing is impossible in principle, so why would you waste precious resources on that? On top of all that, there is this massive peer pressure among engineers themselves to ignore the dissidents, to not signal sympathy with them, even if you feel uneasy yourself. Now, all these answers, while contradicting each other, have two things in common. First, they are excuses why nothing needs to change. 
And second, they try to hide an embarrassing fact. The embarrassing fact is that the spaceship project simply forgot. They forgot about the steering grid. What I just described was a metaphor for the state of AI research just a few years ago. And of course, metaphors are never precise, so they have to be taken with a grain of salt. Now that said, this particular one is surprisingly illuminating. And let me count the similarities. First, the moment when AI surpasses human-level intelligence is often referred to as takeoff. And that's going to affect everyone. And designing a robust AI takeoff is a hard engineering problem. Quoting AI risk researcher Eliezer Yudkowsky, aligning superhuman AI is hard to solve for the same reason as a successful rocket launch is mostly about having the rocket not explode, rather than the hard part being assembling enough fuel. Second, we'll probably get only one chance to get this right. If the takeoff catches us unprepared, the result might be a disaster of cosmic proportions. Quoting Eliezer Yudkowsky again, if you want a picture to symbolize what we're worried about, don't imagine a picture of a Terminator robot with glowing red eyes. Imagine a picture of the Milky Way with a 30,000 light year diameter sphere capped out of it, centered on Earth's former position. Third, talking about the long-term AI safety used to be a complete taboo in the AI research community. Whenever confronted with the issue, people would get instantly defensive and produce these nonsensical answers that contradicted each other. Also, there was a very real peer pressure to not talk about the AI control problem. It's no wonder, then, that the recent AI risk discussion was started by people outside the AI research community. People who weren't afraid to point out that the emperor was naked. My favorite example of the peer pressure was when two AI researchers, who were both very concerned about the AI control issue, were surprised to bump into each other at an AI risk conference. Before that, coming out of the closet moment, they had been working together for nine years as a student and supervisor pair at a top university. Finally, here's a quote. Let us now assume, for the sake of argument, that these machines are a genuine possibility, and look at the consequences of constructing them. It seems probable that once the machine thinking method had started, it would not take long to outstrip our feeble powers. At some stage, therefore, we should have to expect the machines to take control. Who said that and when? The father of computer science, Alan Turing, in 1951. Here's another quote. If we use, to achieve our purposes, a mechanical agency with whose operation we cannot interfere once we have started it, because the action is so fast and irrevocable that we have not the data to intervene before the action is complete, then we had better make quite sure that the purpose put into the machine is the purpose which we, with which we really desire and not merely a colorful imitation of it. Who said that? The father of cybernetics, Norbert Wiener, in 1960. So yes, the entire field simply forgot about the control problem. Having painted such a depressing picture, let me add some good news. The situation has greatly improved over the last few years. In 2014, uh, Nick Bostrom's superintelligence book uh, was published. It became a New York, New York Times bestseller and caused many people to start paying attention. In January 2015, the Future of Life Institute held an AI risk conference in Puerto Rico. It was deliberately set up as a physical meeting between the AI risk and AI research communities. The tangible outcomes of the conference were, one, an open letter calling for AI safety research that was signed by many, if not most, leading AI researchers. And two, Elon Musk, who was there, donated $10 million for AI safety research, money that the uh, Future of Life Institute has been handing out in research grants since. Perhaps most importantly, though, the conference created a bridge between the AI risk and AI research community. It put 
friendly faces on inconvenient arguments and created a mutual understanding that there were reasonable people on both sides. In December 2015, the Center for the Study of Existential Risk at Cambridge University received a 10 million pound grant from the Leverhulme Trust to establish a Center for the Future of Intelligence. Since the Leverhulme Trust is one of the largest private funders of science in the UK, their commitment signals that AI safety research is now considered part of mainstream science. In May 2016, Open Philanthropy Project, a charitable organization founded by Facebook co-founder and billionaire Dustin Moscovich, uh, published a report titled Potential Risks from Advanced Artificial Intelligence, the Philanthropic Opportunity. It is an impressively thorough and well-researched document that argues for more researchers globally to, to be spent on researching how to reduce AI risks. In January this very year, the Future of Life Institute held uh, the second beneficial AI conference in Asilomar, a follow-up to the Puerto Rico conference. Out of that conference emerged 23 principles that have now been signed by well over 1,000 AI and robotics researchers. The common theme of the principles is that the ever-accelerating AI research should be accompanied by a proportional attention to ethics and safety. It's also wonderful to see the peer pressure crumbling. More and more AI researchers are willing to defy the party line and say that controlling artificial intelligence is indeed an important topic that has been neglected. One reason why this delights me a lot is that I have seen something that most AI researchers have not. I am an Estonian, so I had a front row seat at the collapse of the Iron Curtain. I saw that once the state stopped persecuting dissidents, their views were quickly adopted by the others. Initially, the dissident opinions were watered down to sound more moderate than reasonable. Eventually, though, mainstream opinion became nearly identical to the original dissident position, and a few remaining hardcore dogmatists were left behind. Eventually, many dissidents, as well as party members who had switched sides, became the new leaders. And I see a similar process unfolding in AI circles now. As of now, most AI researchers still feel to need to downplay the AI risk issues to sound moderate. But I think this is just historical inertia at this point. Some researchers are openly dissident and therefore leading the charge for change. In particular, I want to thank Stuart Russell, co-author of the leading AI textbook, and Temis Sasavis, uh, as well as his uh, other co-founders at DeepMind. So Temis is the head of DeepMind. Uh, for, their, for them publicly challenging uh, the old party line in the AI research community. If the collapse of the Soviet Union is any indication, we are just a couple of years away from the point where the AI risk topic is considered a natural part of the mainstream discourse. Finally, and most excitingly, we are starting to see first fruits of the research. For instance, AI risk researchers have recently published papers about how to make reinforcement learning agents not care about being turned off, and also how to avoid the wireheading failure mode where the agent takes over its own reward mechanism. There are also some fresh technical results about how to teach machine learning systems to understand and do what we want, instead of maximizing naive goal function that programmers gave it, which of course corresponds to the thing that Norbert Wiener referred to as colorful imitation of what we want. So, using our spaceship metaphor again, some engineers are really designing, already designing and testing various components that might be needed for the steering mechanism. Now, of course, all these positive trends are still facing massive challenges. The amount of resources that humanity spends on AI safety research is still so small that it can basically be rounded to zero. In fact, we're spending more each year on tobacco advertising. Also, even though there is an attitude shift underway in the AI research community, it's not clear yet how to make AI research an integral part of the field. In quoting Holden Garnowski from the Open Philanthropy Project, Ideally, I'd like to see leading researchers in AI and machine learning play leading roles in thinking through potential risks, including the associated technical challenges. Under the status quo, I feel that these fields, 
culturally and institutionally do not provide much incentive to engage with these issues. Stuart Russell likes to point out that just like nuclear fusion research is now almost entirely about containment and no longer about increasing power, we need to redefine the fundamental mission of AI research to be about creating value-aligned systems, not just increasingly competent systems. The other analogy that uh, Stuart Russell draws that I really like is that uh, by downplaying the risks, the nuclear power industry pretty much self-destructed. And he doesn't want to see that happen to AI industry. And in fact, Stuart is now rewriting his AI textbook to reflect that new mission. Another source of constant frustration is bad journalism. Because the media is incentivized to maximize the number of clicks, it often produces shallow articles with sensational headlines, like, and this is an actual, actual headline from British media, Terminator Center to open at the Cambridge University. Such misrepresentation makes the AI risk arguments look silly and therefore undermines the hard-won trust between the AI risk and AI research communities. Finally, I see a looming research talent bottleneck, because improving value alignment is fundamentally harder than increasing AI competence. In the words of an AI researcher uh, at Stanford, Jacob, Jacob, Jacob Strainhardt, knowledge is something that is regularly informed by reality, whereas values are only weakly informed by reality. An AI which learns incorrect facts could notice that it makes wrong predictions, but the world might never tell an AI that it learned the wrong values. So we need many more smart researchers to work on AI value alignment. And some scientists even go as far as to advocate for genetically enhancing humans for that very purpose. Now, overall, I'm cautiously optimistic still. Even though we lost about 50 years by forgetting about the AI risk, the recent progress gives us hope that we can catch up in the remaining time. Even commercial incentives to work on the value alignment might appear. You see, increasingly autonomous robots need to avoid gross ethical mistakes in situations that their programmers just did not foresee. And as Stuart Russell says, the day that some domestic robot decides to cook a cat will be a very bad day for the robotics industry indeed. I'm also hopeful that the media will improve once people become better at recognizing and calling out bad AI journalism. Hopefully talks like this will help. Last but not least, I'm encouraged by the amount of interest among young people. In my experience, people under 30 seem to be very likely to understand and appreciate the AI risk, risk issue. 80,000 Hours, a career guidance site for a movement called Effective Altruists, reports that their AI risk researcher profile is now their most read career guide. In conclusion, imagine the giant spaceship again. 50 years in the making, tens of thousands of engineers improving the engines, and a tiny but growing group working on steering. When will the ship take off? Will the steering mechanism be ready in time? Will the takeoff be soft or hard? Will this thing simply explode? And if everything works out, will it take us to somewhere nice? No one knows yet. Luckily, as we've seen in the last few days, human engineers have been able to construct reliable spaceships before, rockets that take off safely and fly where we want them to. Hopefully, we can pull it off again with this metaphorical spaceship. The stakes have never been higher. Thank you.